So does the holographic model of the universe um, essentially uh, equate with a unified field theory? Well, it does in the sense that, uh, as, as we all know, Einstein said that even though space and time seem to be different in our everyday experience, at some deeper level of reality they're the same thing, they're a continuum, they're fundamentally the same thing. And Bohm takes us a giant step further because he says that everything in the universe is a continuum, an unbroken whole. And part of the, the reason he says that is that uh, when you get down to the level of, micro, of subatomic reality, it's very difficult to, to break up reality. And in fact, you can create two particles, which are kind of like everyone's heard stories of identical twins that are connected. Well, subatomic particles like electrons, protons, etc., also seem to be connected in that way in that something that you do to one particle will instantaneously be registered on another particle. And the reason that Bohm said, hey, this seems holographic is because there's a, a hologram has a remarkable trait. If you take a, a hologram of a rose, for example, and cut it in half and shine a laser through each piece, you'll get a, an image of the rose out of each piece. Cut it in quarters, you get an, four roses. Eights, you get eight roses. And Bohm said it's as if reality is like that, that it's so connected that no, when you look at one small part, you can see things about other parts, that the entire whole is contained in the part. Well, obviously, if you take a hologram and say, I'm going to cut out the piece where the rose is in this hologram, you can't do it because it's everywhere. And in a sense, Bohm is saying you can't, it's, we ultimately can't divide reality up because we're cutting up a hologram. We can't find where one particle is because it's always ref a reflection of all particles. And so in, you'd asked if it, it involves unified field theory in a sort of grand way in the sense the unified field theory, there are four known forces in physics, strong uh, electromagnetisms, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, and gravity. And the unified field theory is the belief that those four forces are actually a continuum, that they're all aspects of a single fundamental force. Well, the holographic idea says that that's probably true, but even more so because everything is a continuum. Not only the forces, but matter, energy, space, time. We're all part of an unbroken whole. So then what happens to the individual in the midst of this unbroken whole? Well, that's a good question, and Bohm, Bohm comes up with a very good answer. He says, he uses the analogy of like whirlpools in a stream. And he says, you know, if you come upon a crook in a stream where little whirlpools are forming, you can look at them and you can see that they have a separate structure. They have an identity and an organization that is separate from the water that's flowing by them in the rest of the stream. But if you try to abstract them out of the hole, if you try to, to say, okay, where does the whirlpool leave off and the stream begins, you can't, you can't find any distinct border. And I think, and he says that that means they are relatively autonomous subtotals, which is a kind of fancy way of saying that they are part of the whole, but they are also unique. And I think this, he says the same is true of us, that yes, we are beings without borders. We are continuum with everything else, but that doesn't take away from our uniqueness. We have identity. We just don't have distinct borders. But within that, within that, you know, those approximate borders of our identity, we are complex and, uh, unique individuals. And this is amazing because again it, it shows how powerful the image is that if we hold an image in our mind with com real faith and real profound belief we can reshape our bodies in ways that we don't realize are possible. So we, you could take something like that, what that, that really tells us is it tells us again about our own untapped potential that we may be able to change. And at one case I talk about in the book where a person did make a positive change is there's a, an Italian fellow named Vittorio Michelli who had cancer of the hip and his, his hip had completely disintegrated and he bathed in Lourdes believing it would cure him and over the course of six months he completely grew back his hip bone. Now modern science tells us that that's impossible. You don't grow back bone. You don't rematerialize bone after it's gone. I have pictures of the x-rays in the book and, and I think that if we learn how to tap this power through belief and profound faith and if you need to believe in a higher power or a particular religious system, fine, but I think we can also we can just believe, we can recognize that we have this power and believe just in that, and when we do that, we'll be able to change our bodies in ways that seem miraculous. Now, do you see medical science uh, becoming more open to the holographic model? Um, well, I think it's going to take a lot of time, you know. Uh, there's, Bernie Siegel tells a story, he, there's, there's some experiments were performed, um, Several experiments have been done studying the power of prayer on healing, and they've come up with some very intriguing results. They're not conclusive, but they're intriguing, that where they've taken individuals 
who didn't even know they were being prayed for, and they would have large groups of people pray, like they, one study involved, I believe, leukemia patients, and they chose half of the patients at random. They had groups of people pray for them, and those halves, that half, had a more of a of a longer lives than the ones who were not being prayed for. Siegel says that he took one of these studies and he put it on a bulletin board at Yale where he teaches, and, and someone wrote across it, this is, you know, nonsense. And um, so it's clear there's a lot of resistance to this, and it's going to take time. But I think what's significant is that most people know there's more to reality, that it may not be that the doctors or the physicists as a whole who make the changes. But a, a recent Gallup poll showed that over 50% of the American public believes in, in some sort of ESP. And I think people know there's more to reality than our picture of the universe that we were taught in high school science class teaches us. I think that's where the change is going to occur. It will take time, but it will eventually happen. Yeah, Larry Dosey also cited a prayer study and research in his latest book, Recovering the Soul. Right, right. Well, it shows again that the practical applications of this holographic idea that I, I always say we're like infants sitting at the control panel of a jumbo jet. We have so much that we could do. And, you, and the reason that I'm interested, people sometimes say, why are you interested in such weird things? And it's not because I'm just interested in the weird, but I am interested in what those things teach us and the practical applications those things have. And a lot of the incidents that I talk about in the book, although they may seem very strange, like the stigmatists, the bottom line is always, if they can do that through belief, no matter what approach they use to developing that belief, hypnosis, faith, whatever, we have that latent ability within us. And this, the power of prayer, again, suggests that reality, that we have a lot more influence over reality. And that's, that's one of the most exciting things about the holographic idea, is that it is a very empowering idea. It says we, we don't realize how much we can affect the world, the universe, just through our attitudes and through what we believe, and that we've got to be, you know, we've, we've got to stop being infants at the control panel of that jet. We've got to learn what all those switches and all those amazing mechanisms are for and how to do them, how to use them. Also, the holographic model uh, says that the past is, is present, that, and the future may even be present as well, and enfolded in Bohm's terms, Enfolded within the implicate order, right. and somehow that can unfold itself, and maybe there's ways to access the past, the present, and even the future. Right. Well, it's, it's very interesting, and this is this is an area where people start their eyes start to sort of flutter, and they go, "Oh, I don't know if I can handle this," because we're so uh, familiar with our concept of time that we only exist in the present that it's it's very reality challenging for us to think that we might be able to access information about the future or the past but the evidence is overwhelming i talk in the book about uh very eminent archaeologists who have used psychics to tap into the past psychically to take an artifact and hold on to it and start to see uh an image of the past and what's interesting is that these psychics often refer to these Im what they see as a hologram they say well i see a hologram i uh, of what this person was doing this you know this primitive uh tool maker or whatever uh and the future stuff is even more more uh, sort of disturbing in a way, but I think it's important. I don't, I don't believe the future is frozen in stone, but what I do believe is that the future is coalescing to a certain degree, just as, I mean, everyone has a date book where they start to X in stuff in the future, and I think that's what ha what's happening. And when people access the future, what they're doing is seeing probabilities. They're seeing what's more likely to happen, what is starting to coalesce. And it's clear that we do this on an unconscious level because I think we have all these abilities, we just don't realize we have them, and so they're unconscious in ourselves. There's a study I talk about in the book where a fellow uh, studied train wrecks in the Chicago area over a period of several years and discovered that on, when, when there was a major accident that, that resulted in fatalities, the attendance on the train was always below normal, significantly so which suggests that maybe at an unconscious level we know more about the future than we, than we consciously realize. And the holographic idea says that the future, this, this sort of blur of probabilities, which future is starting to coalesce more than another, is always present, is always enfolded in the whole, just as, this, as there's an unbroken wholeness amongst all things, all objects in the universe, there's an unbroken wholeness between the past and the future and the present. But if we knew how to sort of tilt the, hol the hologram of the universe or the hologram of reality like it's a gem, we could tilt it at different angles to see different aspects of time in each of its different facets.